Okay, so when we last left off, we were doing mass to mole conversions, and we have a method using the formula ratio and our molar mass to equate the grams of one element in a compound to the grams of another element in that same compound. So uh, let's do an example just as a refresher. So in this question, we're asked how many atoms of sodium are present in a sample of sodium cyanide containing 4.5 grams of carbon, okay? So we're not given the formula explicitly, but if we know the name, we can certainly figure out the formula. Would someone like to volunteer either verbally or in the chat? Would someone like to volunteer and provide me the formula for sodium cyanide? What would the, yep, NaCN, so sodium cyanide is composed of sodium plus and cyanide, which is CN minus. We cross our charges and that gives us NaCN or sodium cyanide. Okay, perfect. We have the formula and from that we can figure out the formula ratio. Okay, so we know that we're starting off with 4.5 grams of carbon and our end goal, our end goal is to report the atoms of sodium. Okay. Now looking at this problem, going from grams of carbon to atoms of sodium, what central units are we going to go through? How do we relate the quantities of carbon and sodium. How do we relate the quantities of carbon and sodium? What units do we go through if we want to relate the moles of carbon in our sample and the moles of sodium? We go through moles. So we go through moles of carbon. From our formula ratio, we can go to the moles of sodium and then we can go to moles, we can go from moles to atoms using Avogadro's number. So for the first conversion, we'll use the molar mass of carbon. For the second conversion, we'll use our formula ratio. And for the third conversion, we'll use Avogadro's number. So now that we have our problem solving scheme established, let's now execute on that. So we have 4.5 grams of carbon. And we know that in one mole of carbon, we have approximately 12 grams. So that's our molar mass. Now let's plug in our formula ratio. My, if we're going from moles of carbon to moles of sodium, how many moles of sodium do we have per mole of carbon? What's our mole to mole ratio? One to one, exactly right. Because as you see, we have one sodium atom in our formula per every one carbon atom. Wonderful. Now to finish off this problem, we have to convert from moles of sodium to atoms of sodium. And to do that, we use Avogadro's number. So how many atoms, so how many atoms are present in one mole of sodium? How many atoms are present in one mole? What is Avogadro's number, just as a refresher? 6.020 times 10 to the 23. Yep, exactly. Perfect. So now we see grams of carbon cancel, moles of carbon cancels, moles of sodium cancels, and we're left with atoms of sodium. So let's punch that into our calculator really quickly. So we have 4.5 divided by 12 times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, and that in turn gives us 2.3 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of sodium respecting the fact that our input had two sig figs. Any questions on this example? Any questions on this example? If not, let's apply our understanding. 
And let's look at the following example where we're asked how many atoms of oxygen are in a sample of glucose that contains 43.55 grams of hydrogen. Now don't be shy to share your responses via the chat verbally, or you can also submit your responses and I'll check to see how the class is doing by submitting your responses on Canvas Quiz 4.3.5 which is another one of our problem solving exercises. So we'll spend about four minutes working through this problem and then we'll come together as a group to discuss. And I'll be checking both submitted responses via Canvas and submitted responses in the chat to see how everyone's doing. If there are any questions, don't be shy to unmute and ask them or to ask them in the chat. So I'm seeing some reasonable responses so far in the chat. Let's try to get a few more responses and then we'll discuss this example in about three minutes. And if there are any questions or if you have any comments or proposed solutions, don't be shy to share them in the chat or verbally. And so far, all of the responses that I'm seeing via Canvas and in the chat are perfectly correct. Let's try to get a few more responses just so that we have a majority of the class responding and we'll discuss in about two minutes. And if there are any questions at all, really do not hesitate to ask. Okay, so I see a reasonable selection of correct responses and a reasonable selection of discussions on this problem. So let's now discuss this example together as a class. So we're asked to find the atoms of oxygen in a sample of glucose that has 43.55 grams of hydrogen. So we're going from grams of hydrogen and our end goal is to report the atoms of oxygen. Okay, so then what intermediate unit are we going to go through? What intermediate units are we gonna go through to relate the amount of hydrogen and oxygen in our sample? What is our, what, what intermediate units are we gonna go through? Moles, yep. So we're gonna go from grams of hydrogen to moles of hydrogen. And then from the moles of hydrogen, since we know the formula, we can figure out the moles of oxygen. Okay, 
So now that we have our rough problem solving scheme established, to go from grams to moles, we're going to use our molar mass of hydrogen. To go from moles of hydrogen to moles of oxygen, we're going to use our formula ratio. And from moles of oxygen to atoms of oxygen, we're going to use Avogadro's number. Okay, so now that we have our problem solving scheme established, we're going to execute on that. So we have 43.55 grams of hydrogen. And we know from our molar mass, and hydrogen makes this pretty easy, we have one mole of hydrogen for every one gram of hydrogen. Now, looking at our formula ratio, we're going from moles of hydrogen to moles of oxygen. Now, how many moles of oxygen are present per mole of hydrogen? What is our mole to mole ratio? What is our mole to mole ratio of oxygen to hydrogen? Looking at our chemical formula, what is our mole to mole ratio going to be? We have how many moles of oxygen per how many moles of hydrogen? Six to 12, yep, we have six moles of oxygen for every 12 moles of hydrogen. Perfect. Continuing on, we have how many atoms of oxygen in one mole of oxygen? Again, we'll plug in Avogadro's number, which would be 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of oxygen. And if we punch this into our calculator, we get, let me punch this in just to be sure. So we have 43.55 divided by one divided by two times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, which gives us 131.1 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of oxygen that we rewrite as 1.311 times 10 to the 25th atoms of oxygen. There we go, four sig figs because our input has four sig figs and Avogadro's number is an exact number. Any questions on this example? Any questions on this example? If not, let's continue on and let's do a few more examples. In this case now, we're going to introduce another way of expressing the composition of a compound or just a comp the composition of a sample of matter in general. So molecules are made of atoms of their component elements, okay? The percentage of each element in a compound can be written in terms of either mass percentage or mole percentage, where mass percent is the mass of our element over our total mass. Now, if we want to look at mass percent, in if we're looking specifically at a pure sample of a compound, you can write it as the mass of your element over your molar mass. This is another form of the mass percentage equation if you're dealing with a sample that is only containing molecules of a single compound and nothing else. You can also express composition in terms of mole percent where mole percentage is the moles of your element over the total moles present in your sample. Mass percent is by far the more common metric. Well, that's nice, but how can we actually use that? Well, let's talk about how we calculate mole percent.
first, since it's a little bit easier to calculate. So first we're gonna determine the number of each atom of each element from the molecular formula. Okay, so suppose that we're looking at calcium chloride. Okay, how many moles of calcium, or even more, more, even at a smaller scale, how many atoms of calcium do we have? How many atoms of calcium do we have? How many calciums do we see? One. Yep, yep. So we have one atom of calcium. And repeating this process for chlorine, we have two atoms of chlorine. Okay. Now, from this relationship, from this atom to atom relationship, we can write out a mole to mole relationship. So we can determine the moles of each atom of each element and the total moles of all atoms. So we can say if we have, whoops, let me zoom in really quickly. So we can say if we have one atom of calcium and two atoms of chlorine, we can rewrite this as one mole of calcium, two moles of chlorine, and if we add them together, we get three moles of atoms total. Okay, so we have the moles of each element and the total moles of atoms. Wonderful. Now from this information, we can calculate mole percent. So let's suppose we wanna figure out the mole percentage of calcium in our sample. We'd say the mole percentage of calcium is the moles of calcium, which is one mole of calcium over the total moles, which is three moles of atoms times 100%. And that in turn gives us a mole percentage of roughly 33%. We can do this exact same calculation to figure out the mole percentage of chlorine in our sample. So we take two moles of chlorine over three moles of atoms times 100%. And that in turn gives us about 67%. Now, one thing that I do want you to pay attention to is that if you add up both these mole percentages, you should get 100%. If not, you're likely missing a component of your compound or mixture, or there was a calculation error. So this is a great way just to check your work. Any questions so far? If not, let's continue on now. And let's talk about how we'd calculate mass percent. So again, we're looking at calcium chloride. We determine the moles of each element. Okay, that's, that's easy. We, we've established we have one mole of calcium. We have two moles of chlorine. We get that from our chemical formula. That we've done a lot. Now we have to calculate the mass of each element. Okay, so the grams of calcium are equal to one mole of calcium times 40 gram per mole. And that gives us for our mass of calcium, we have 40 grams of calcium. Okay, let's look at the grams of chlorine. We have two moles of chlorine, and it has a molar mass of 35.5 gram per mole. And if we punch this into our calculator, if we punch this into the R calculator, we get, in terms of our grams of chlorine, we get a mass of 71.0 grams. Wonderful. Okay, now we can calculate the total mass. 
So for our total mass, we're gonna add the mass of calcium, which is 40 grams, plus the mass of chlorine, which is 71.0 grams. And that in turn gives us 111 grams total. Now we have all the information we need to calculate the mass percentage of each element. So the mass percentage of calcium would be equal to the mass of calcium over our total mass times 100%. Now let's punch this into our calculator really quickly just to check how everything is going. So we have 40 over 111 times 100%, and that gives us a mass percentage of roughly 36%. Let's repeat the same calculation for the mass percentage of chlorine. So the mass percentage of chlorine, we have 71 grams over 111 grams times 100%. And that in turn gives us a mass percentage of roughly 64%. Again, just as a mental check, if we take both of our mass percentages, they will add together to give us 100%. So that means we haven't made any egregious calculation errors. Does that make sense so far to everyone? Any questions so far? Okay, well, if we don't have any questions, let's focus on showing more examples of these calculations. So in this guided example 4.5, we have to calculate the mole percentage of each element in nitric acid. And I'm, I'm just gonna draw a picture of nitric acid, just showing all the atoms. So this isn't really a picture showcasing chemical connectivity. This is just used for us to count atoms. Okay, so listing off, how many moles of hydrogen do we have? How many moles of hydrogen do we have? One, yep, okay. How many moles of oxygen do we have? Three, yep. Yeah. We also know we have one mole of nitrogen, perfect. So for our total moles, we have five moles of atoms total. So now we have all the information we need to calculate the mole percentage of each element. So the mole percentage of hydrogen is equal to one mole of hydrogen over five moles total times 100%. That in turn gives us a mole percentage of 20%. The mole percentage of oxygen is equal to three moles of oxygen over five moles total times 100%, which will give us 60%. And the mole percentage of nitrogen is one mole of nitrogen over, whoops, over five moles times 100%, which in turn gives us 20%. All of these mole percentages in turn will add up to 100%. Any questions? Any questions on this example? Okay, so let's take this one step further and let's calculate the mass percentage of each element in nitric acid. So this is another guided example just to show a full circle of how you'd complete these kinds of problems. So we've already done some work here in that we know we have one mole of hydrogen, three moles of oxygen, and one mole of nitrogen. Well, 
let's do some mass to mole conversions here. Let's do some mass to mole conversions here. So one mole of hydrogen, we have one gram of hydrogen per mole of hydrogen. So we have one gram of hydrogen in our sample. For our three moles of oxygen, we know that we have 16 grams of oxygen in one mole of oxygen. So that gives us 48 grams of oxygen. Okay. And if we have one mole of nitrogen and we have 14 grams of nitrogen in one mole of nitrogen, that gives us 14 grams of nitrogen. So adding this together, our mass total, otherwise known as the molar mass in this case, is equal to one gram plus 48 grams plus 14 grams. And that in turn gives us a total mass. Let's check. We punch it into our calculator, we get 63 grams per mole of nitric acid. And we've done these molar mass calculations before. Okay, so now that we have all of this mass data collected, we have all the information we need to calculate the mass percentage of each element. So for hydrogen, we take the mass of hydrogen, which is one gram, over our 63 grams total times 100%. And punching that into our calculator, we get a mass percentage of 1.6%. Note, all of these masses are built on the number of atoms and your atomic masses. So these mass percentages will have a, can have a very large number of sig figs because you're performing calculations involving exact numbers. Okay, let's look at the mass percentage of oxygen. So we have 48 grams of oxygen over 63 grams total. So times 100%. That in turn gives us a mass percentage of 76.2%. So the majority of the mass of this nitric acid is oxygen. So just remember mass and mole percent are two different things. So the mass percentage and mole percentage will overwhelmingly be different. Okay. Let's calculate the mass percentage of nitrogen now. So we have 14 grams of nitrogen over 63 grams times 100%. And if we did everything correctly, these should all add up to 100% and we get 22.2% for our mass percentage of nitrogen. Now, if we add all of these percentages together, We do in fact get a total mass percentage of 100%, which means that we've likely not committed a major calculation error. Do these examples make sense to everyone? Any questions? Uh, professor? Mm -hmm. How do, you, how do you determine the sig figs to use for the percentages? Ah, um, you'll be requested, you'll be given a specific like number of sig figs to report. In this case, because all of these numbers are exact, so like the molar, ma the molar mass of hydrogen, the molar mass of nitrogen, the number of nitrogen atoms, all of those numbers are exact, your mass percentages are the result of calculations involving exact numbers. So they'll have a very, very large number of sig figs. I'm just truncating it. Um, it. In general, for sig fig rules, if you're dealing with only exact numbers, then you report the maximum number of sig figs that the exact number is given in. So if, the, if they give you an exact number with 
four sig figs, then your answer would report with four, even though we both, we, even though we know that that exact number has more than four sig figs. Does that make sense? It, this is just a weird case where all of the numbers going into our calculations are exact numbers or numbers with a very large number of sig figs. Um, just as a rule, you'd want to report each of your mass percentages with the same number of sig figs. Um, and you'll be told explicitly in the problem for these kinds of mass percentage and mole percentage from formula questions, how many sig figs to report. But that, that's a relatively minor part of this question as the numbers are exact. Okay, so now that we've seen some examples of these calculations, let's take a moment and I'd like you to calculate the mole percentage of each element in dioxygen difluoride. And you're more than welcome to submit your responses in the text, in the chat, verbally, or via Canvas Quiz 4.5. And I'll be checking to see how the class is going through each of these exercises and providing feedback. And of course, if you want individualized feedback or if you have any questions going through this problem during our problem solving session, don't be shy to send a message in the chat, either publicly or privately, and I'll be happy to provide feedback on your response. And we'll discuss in about two to three minutes, as this calculation should actually be pretty fast. And I'm seeing a range of, of responses via Canvas. Let's try to get a few more responses and then we'll discuss in about a minute and a half to two minutes. And if there are any questions on this example, really don't be shy to ask. And we'll discuss in about another minute.
Okay, so let's talk about this example. So in dioxygen difluoride, how many moles of oxygen do we have? How many oxygen atoms do we have? Two, yeah, we have two moles of oxygen. And how many moles of fluorine do we have? How many moles of fluorine do we have? Two, okay. So the mole percentage of oxygen would be equal to two moles of oxygen over our total moles. And for our total moles, two plus two gives us four moles of atoms. So for our mole percentage of oxygen, we'd have two moles of oxygen over four moles of atoms times 100%. And that in turn gives us a mole percentage of 50%. The mole percentage of fluorine, I mean, we can figure out just by the fact that both the mole percentages add to 100 that the mole percentage of fluorine will be 50%, but it's better to calculate it from scratch if we have all the data. So we'd have two moles of fluorine over four moles total times 100%, which gives us a mole percentage of 50%. Both of our mole percentages add to 100%, and that's it. So we've checked our work and completed a mole percentage calculation from the formula. Okay, that's nice. Now, any questions before we move on? If not, let's try to apply our logic and apply our problem solving process to calculate the mass percentage of each element in dioxygen difluoride, considering that we already know we have two moles of oxygen and two moles of fluorine. So let's take about two minutes and, or well, let's do two to three, and let's work through and let's try to calculate the mass percentage of each element in dioxygen difluoride. And we'll discuss in about two to three minutes. We already see some responses via Canvas. Don't be shy to submit your responses in the chat verbally or via the Canvas quiz feature. And we'll discuss in about another minute. Let's try to get a few more responses in the chat or via Canvas. But I'm seeing a lot of reasonable responses via Canvas, which is quite which is quite encouraging to see. Okay, as I see a reasonable number of responses in the chat and via Canvas, let's discuss this example. So first, let's figure out the grams of oxygen in our sample. So we have two moles of oxygen 
and we know our molar mass of oxygen is 16 grams of oxygen per one mole of oxygen. That in turn gives us 32 grams of oxygen. For our grams of fluorine, we have two moles of fluorine. And we know that the molar mass of fluorine, so let's look that up in the periodic table. We don't use that, we don't use the molar mass of fluorine a ton because it's not super common in compounds that we see, at least in the lab. So our molar mass of fluorine is 19 grams of fluorine per one mole of fluorine. Moles cancel, and that gives us 38 grams of fluorine. If we add our masses together, our total mass is equal to 32 grams plus 38 grams, which gives us 70 grams. Wonderful. Now we can calculate the mass percentage of oxygen, which is 32 grams of oxygen over 70 grams total times 100%. Punching that into our calculator, so we have 32 over 70 times 100%. That in turn gives us 45.7%. Let's now calculate the mass percentage of fluorine, which is 38 grams over 70 grams times 100%. which in turn gives us a mass percentage of 54.3%. If we add our mass percentages together, we get a total mass percentage of 100%, which is exactly what we should see if we performed our calculations accurately. Any questions on this example? Now, these previous examples that we worked through covered mass percentage in the context of looking at a compound and utilizing its formula to figure out the mass percentage of each element. Now, mass percentage also applies to samples that could be mixtures of many different compounds. So, in this case, I'd like us now to consider how we can use mass percentage as another conversion factor. So mass percentage is the grams of an element per the grams of a sample. Uh, in this case, it's the grams of an element per 100 grams of sample. So if we think about mass percentage in terms of this conversion factor, we can begin to use it to convert to and from the mass of our sample to the mass of an individual component in that sample, be it an element or a compound. So let's, let's look at an example. So if we wanna go from the mass of our sample to the mass of an element, we multiply by the mass percentage of our element over 100. The mass of our sample, we, we can think of it as multiplying by the mass percentage of our compound over 100% to get the mass of our compound. Let's show an example about how this would work, how we can calculate the mass of an element found in a sample. So let's suppose we have a 35.5 gram sample that has 23.5% silicon, okay? So we're trying to go from grams of sample to grams of silicon. So grams of a sample to the mass of our element in that sample. So if we have 35.5 grams, my question to everyone, if we know the mass percentage of silicon, how many grams of silicon do we have per 100 grams of sample? How many grams of silicon do we have per 100 grams of sample? What is our percentage of silicon? What is our mass percentage of silicon? 23.5. Yep, so we can say we have 23.5 grams of silicon 
per 100 grams of sample. So this 23.5% is just simply saying that we have 23.5 grams of silicon per 100 grams of sample. And if we plugged in the numbers, we'd see that the mass percentage does check out in our calculation. So this is another way of writing mass percentage as a conversion factor. So as we see, grams of sample cancels and we're left with punching it into our calculator. Eight. 0.34 grams of silicon. Does this make sense to everyone so far? So let's now apply this idea of mass percentage as a conversion factor to the following example. So in this case, a 20 gram sample is analyzed and is found to contain 13% carbon by mass. And I'd like you to answer the question this time, how many moles of carbon are present in the sample? So let's take about three minutes to work through this example, and you're welcome to submit your responses in the chat or via Canvas quiz 4.6. I'm already seeing some reasonable responses. Everyone's pretty fast entering and setting up these calculations, but let's take about three minutes and let's try to get a pool of responses from the entire class but the responses i'm seeing so far look perfect And if you have any questions, don't be shy to submit them via the public or private Zoom chat or unmute and ask your question verbally. And we'll discuss in about another two to two and a half minutes. And checking, I see a large portion of the class has submitted responses via Canvas, and the responses look quite, quite good so far. We'll discuss in about another minute to a minute and a half. And if there are any questions at all, or if you'd like to submit your responses via the, via the Zoom chat, do not hesitate. I'd be happy to provide some feedback. Otherwise, we'll discuss this example together in about one minute.
Okay, so let's discuss this example. So we have a 20 gram sample, so we're going from a, the grams of sample, and we're trying to figure out the moles of carbon, okay? So what is our intermediate unit? What is our intermediate unit between the grams of sample and the moles of, of carbon? What are we gonna calculate in this middle portion here? What is our intermediate unit? I always like to think in terms of units, so what units are we going to go through? If we're going from grams of sample to moles of carbon, what units are we going to go through? So we want to calculate the moles of carbon. And where are we going to get the moles of carbon from? Where do we typically calculate moles from? The grams of carbon, exactly. Okay, perfect. So we have our problem solving scheme set up. Now let's fill in our conversion factor. So for our first step to go from grams of sample to grams of carbon, we'll use our mass percent. To go from grams of carbon to moles of carbon, we'll use our molar mass. And now that we've filled in all of our conversion factors, we're ready to execute. So we have a 20 gram sample, okay? And let's fill in now, how many grams of carbon do we have per 100 grams of sample? How many grams of carbon do we have per 100 grams of sample? What is our mass percentage? 13, okay? So our grams of sample cancels. We're on the right track so far. Next, in one mole of carbon, we have how many grams of carbon? That's 12. So if we punch this into our calculator, if we punch this into our calculator, we will get 0 0.22 moles of carbon. Again, just to, to re-emphasize this idea, Just to re-emphasize this idea, the mass percentage is equal to the grams of sample over, sorry, the grams of your component over 100 grams of sample. That's one way you can think about mass percentage as a conversion factor. It's very useful since it allows you to do these one-line unit conversions. Any questions on this example? Okay, so let's keep going now. And let's do another guided example. Keeping in mind, remember when we discussed mass percentage, when we talked about mass percentage, we recalled quite clearly that the mass percentage of each component element should total to 100%. So let's see how, that, how we can apply that idea. So a 15 gram sample is analyzed and found to contain 14% carbon with the remaining mass being fluorine, okay? And we're asked how many moles of fluorine are present in the sample? Well, we know that the mass percentage of carbon plus the mass percentage of fluorine must equal 100%. Okay, ergo, the mass percentage of fluorine is equal to 100% minus the mass percentage of carbon, which is 14%. That in turn gives us a mass percentage of fluorine of 86%. Wonder. Okay, so now we're trying to go from the grams of sample to the moles of fluorine. And to do that, we're going to go through the grams of fluorine. Just to fill in our problem solving scheme to go from grams of sample to grams of fluorine, we're going to use our mass percentage of fluorine. 
And to go from grams of fluorine to moles, we'll use our molar mass. Now that we have our scheme prepared, we'll execute on it. So we have 15 grams of sample, and we know from our mass percentage of fluorine, note we're using the mass percentage of fluorine here, we have 86 grams of fluorine for every 100 grams of sample. The grams of sample cancel. And to go to moles, we know in one mole of fluorine, we have 19 grams of fluorine. Grams of fluorine cancels, and we're left with the following. So we have 15 times 86 over 100 divided by 19, and that in turn gives us 0 0.68 moles of fluorine. So just remember that the total of all of your mass percentages should add to 100 if you're accounting for every single component in your sample. Since we know that this sample only has carbon and fluorine, we can solve for the mass percentage of fluorine and then use that to complete our calculation. Any questions on this example? Any questions on this example? If not, let's try to apply what we've learned and tackle the following example. I'd like you to submit your responses via the chat, verbally, or via Canvas Quiz 4.6.1, and I'll check to see how the class is doing and provide feedback on their responses. And we'll come together to discuss in about three to four minutes. And if you have any questions at all, don't be shy to ask them in the chat or verbally, and I'll be happy to provide feedback. And we already are starting to see some responses. It's good, it's good. It's like likely people are preparing and looking through the notes before a lecture, which is always encouraging to see. And we'll discuss in about three minutes. And don't be shy to submit your responses, and I'd be happy to provide individualized feedback. And if you have any questions, don't be shy to ask. We're already seeing some reasonable responses. All the responses I'm seeing so far via Canvas look quite good. Let's try to get a few more responses and we'll discuss in about another minute to a minute and a half. And if there are any questions, don't be shy to ask them in the chat or verbally.
Okay, so let's discuss this example. So a 30 gram sample is analyzed and found to contain 30% silicon by mass with the remaining mass being oxygen. We're asked to find how many moles of oxygen are present in our sample. So solving for the mass percentage of oxygen, we take 100% minus the mass percentage of sulfur, sorry, not silicon, sulfur, which is 30%. So that gives us a mass percentage of oxygen of 70%. Now from here, we're trying to go from the grams of sample to the moles of oxygen. And to do that, we're gonna go through the intermediate unit of grams of oxygen. To go from grams of sample to grams of oxygen, we're gonna use the mass percentage of oxygen to go from grams of oxygen to moles of oxygen, we're gonna use our molar mass, otherwise known as our molecular weight. So now that we have our scheme all filled in, let's just execute on it. So we have 30 grams of sample. For the mass percentage of oxygen, we, we know, oops, sorry about that. We know that we have 70, grams of oxygen for every 100 grams of sample. Our grams of sample cancels. And now that we want to go from the mass percentage, now that, we, now that we've gone from the grams of sample to the grams of oxygen using our mass percent, we want to go from the mass of oxygen to the moles of oxygen. So we use our molar mass. So we have one mole of oxygen for every 16 grams and if we punch this into our calculator, punch this into our calculator really quickly, that in turn gives us 1.3 moles of oxygen. Perfect. Any questions on this example? If not, let's continue on. Let's continue our problem solving. So let's do an advanced example now. In this case, we're dealing with multi-step conversions using mass percent. So I'd like you, when working through this problem, to try to submit your responses in the chat verbally or via Canvas quiz 4.6.2. Okay, so let's read through this problem. Let's look at the first portion of this problem. So a two gram tablet of aspirin is 16.3% acetyl salicylic acid by mass. So a certain percentage of the total mass is this compound here. We're asked to calculate the mass of acetyl salicylic acid, which is the active component of aspirin. And we're asked to calculate the moles of acetyl salicylic acid in the tablet. So let's take about four minutes and let's work through the first part of this advanced example. And don't be shy to submit your responses via the chat. So we'll discuss this portion and this problem, the first half of this problem, in about four minutes. And don't be shy to submit your responses via Canvas, chat, or verbally. And again, really don't be shy to ask questions.
If there are any questions, don't hesitate to ask. And if you have any responses so far, don't hesitate to submit them in the chat or via Canvas, and I'd be happy to provide feedback. If not, we'll discuss in about another minute and a half to two minutes. So I'm seeing some reasonable responses so far, both via Canvas and in the chat. Let's spend another, about another minute to a minute and a half on this problem, and then we'll discuss. If I can get a few more responses in the chat, verbally or via Canvas, that would be perfect to allow me to make sure the class is processing these examples. And if there are any questions or common, um, common calculation errors, I'd be happy to address them. If not, we'll discuss in about another minute. And if there are any questions, really don't hesitate to ask. If not, we'll discuss briefly in about 30 seconds. Okay, so let's discuss. So we're asked to calculate the mass of acetyl salicylic acid. So we're asked to go from the mass of our tablet to the grams of acetyl salicylic acid, which is C9H8O4, okay? So then we know if we have two grams of our tablet and our mass percentage is 16.3%, we know that we have 16.3 grams of acetyl salicylic acid for every 100 grams total of sample. Grams of sample cancels, and we're left with the grams of acetyl salicylic acid, which is two times 16.3 over 100, which gives us 0 0.326 moles of acetyl salicylic acid. Note, we'd only be able to retain through one sig fig, but we're gonna carry this through in our calculations. Okay, continuing on, we're next asked to calculate the moles of acetyl salicylic acid. Oh, whoops, sorry, this is 0 0.326 grams. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Now that we have the mass of acetyl salicylic acid, it's quite easy to calculate the moles. So in this case, we're going from the grams of acetyl salicylic acid to the moles of acetyl salicylic acid. And to do that, we're gonna use our molar mass, which is conveniently provided to us. So we have 0 0.326 grams And we know in one mole of our sample, we have 180 grams. And that, if we punch it into our calculator, gives us 0 0.001811 moles 
Now, of course, we aren't retaining all of these sig figs. We can only carry through one sig fig based on our input, but we're gonna carry through all of our digits into future calculations. Any questions so far? Any questions so far? Okay, so now that we have the moles of acetyl salicylic acid, let's just write that down here. I'd like you now to take another three to four minutes and to work through the next example where we're asked for the same problem carrying over from the previous part. I'd like you using our moles of acetyl salicylic acid, I'd like you to calculate the moles of oxygen and the mass of oxygen in this two gram tablet. So I'd like you to calculate the moles of oxygen and the mass of oxygen in this tablet. And we'll spend about three to four minutes on this example and don't be shy to submit your responses via the chat or via Canvas. And we'll discuss this example in about three to four minutes. So this is the kind of multi-part problem that you'd see on an exam that really tests what we've learned from throughout this chapter. And the responses I see in the chat look good so far. Let's continue to get more responses. And don't be shy to submit your responses via the chat or via Canvas. So the response that I see in the chat looks good. It just needs to be rounded to the correct number of sig figs. Let's try to get a few more responses in the chat and via Canvas. And if there are any questions as you work through these problems, see a lot more responses via Canvas. That looks good so far. And then we'll discuss in about another minute and a half. And the responses I'm seeing in the chat look, look good so far. And we'll discuss in about another minute to 30 seconds. Thank you again for submitting responses via the chat and Canvas. Really helps me get a sense of, sense of where everyone's at. And let's now discuss this example just to provide some additional guidance, okay? So if we wanna go from the moles 
of acetyl salicylic acid to the moles of oxygen. We are going to have to take a look at our chemical formula and our formula ratio. So if we have 0 0.001811 moles of acetyl salicylic acid, my question to all of you is, looking at our chemical formula, how many moles of oxygen do we have per mole of our acetyl salicylic acid? How many moles of oxygen do you see? How many oxygens are in our formula? How many oxygen atoms are in our formula? Four. So we have four moles of oxygen per mole of acetyl salicylic acid. Perfect. So the moles of acetyl salicylic acid cancels. And if we punch this into our calculator, we'll get 0 0.007244. Again, we can only retain one sig fig, but we carry through all of our digits through these calculations, moles of oxygen. Okay, perfect. So that's not too bad. Now we're asked to calculate the mass of oxygen. Okay, so we're trying to go from the moles of oxygen to the grams of oxygen. And to do that, we use our molar mass. That we can do. So we have 0 0.007244 moles of oxygen. And we know that we have 16 grams of oxygen for every one mole of oxygen. Moles of oxygen cancels. And we're left with 0 0.1 one five nine grams of oxygen, which if we were rounding, we just round this to 0 0.1 grams of oxygen. But we're not gonna round just yet because we have one last payoff for this question. And I'd like you to take a moment to calculate the mass percentage of oxygen given that we have a two gram tablet. So let's take about one to two minutes and given our mass of oxygen and our total mass, let's calculate the mass percentage of oxygen in the tap. And we'll discuss in about a minute to two minutes. And the responses I see in the chat and via Canvas are looking good so far. Let's try to get a few more responses in the chat and Canvas and then we'll discuss. And if there are any questions, don't be shy to ask them verbally or via the chat. I'm getting a lot more responses via Canvas, that's good. Let's try to get a few more responses via Canvas or in the chat, and we'll discuss in about another minute to 30 seconds. All we're doing is finishing up by calculating the mass percentage of oxygen in our tablet. Okay, so let's discuss this example. So mass percentage, so in this case, the mass percentage of oxygen is equal to the mass of oxygen over the total mass of our tablet. 
times 100%. Let me make that oxygen symbol a little bit more distinguishable. Okay, so if we punch this into our calculator, if we punch this into our calculator, we have 0 0.1159 over 2 times 100, and that in turn gives us 5.7, sorry, 5.795% that we round to 6%. So about 6% of the mass of an aspirin tablet is oxygen from our acetyl salicylic acid. So this is the kind of example that you'd expect to see on an exam where you have to do multiple calculations, a mass percent, a mass to mole conversion, et cetera. So it really encapsulates a lot of the conversions that we've discussed earlier on in this chapter. Now, are there any questions on this example? Any questions on this example? If not, we'll be doing another example. So this is found on Canvas Quiz 4.6.3 if you want to submit your responses and get immediate feedback via Canvas. And let's look at the following problem. Ethanol has a density that's given here. Ethanol has the following mass percentages of each element by mass. I'd like you to determine the mass of hydrogen in 0.1 liters of ethanol, and I'd like you to determine the moles of hydrogen in 0.1 liters of ethanol. So we'll discuss this example in about four minutes, and don't be shy to ask questions or submit your responses via the chat or via Canvas. This is incredibly helpful at when we see how the class is progressing through these problem solving sessions, and if there are additional practice examples that we can work on to further develop these skills. And we'll discuss in about another three minutes. So checking to see how everyone's doing in the chat and via Canvas. I'm seeing some reasonable responses so far via Canvas. Let's try to get a few more responses as well as a few more questions or responses in the chat. I'd be more than happy to provide individualized feedback um, for any response submitted. Just so that way, and if you're still working through this problem and need more time, don't worry, we still have about another two to two and a half minutes working through these two calculations.
And my one piece of advice is just make sure you're converting from liters to milliliters before you calculate and use the density. And for the response submitted in the chat, I would double check your conversion from liters to milliliters. Just to make sure you have the correct power of 10. Let's try to get a few more responses before we discuss in about another minute and a half. The responses I see in the chat look good so far. Let's try to get a few more responses and then we'll discuss in about another minute to, and another 30 seconds to a minute. So let's now discuss this example just to provide a little bit of guidance. So first and foremost, if we wanna figure out the mass of hydrogen, we're gonna go first from the liters of ethanol. Our density is in milliliters, so we're gonna to go to milliliters of ethanol. From milliliters of ethanol, we can calculate the grams of ethanol. And then since we know the mass percentage, we can go from the grams of ethanol to the grams of hydrogen. Wonderful. So we have 0 0.1 liters of ethanol. And we know that in one milliliter, we have 10 to the negative third liters. Okay. Given our density, so to go from milliliters of ethanol to grams, we'd have grams on top which would be 0 0.789 grams per every one milliliter of ethanol. Okay, and now my question to all of you is, how many grams of hydrogen do we have per gram of our ethanol sample? What, is, what, what, what do we plug in for this conversion factor? What do we plug in for our mass percent conversion factor? So how many grams of hydrogen do we have per how many grams of sample? What do we plug in for our mass percentage conversion factor? And this is really important. Yep, we'd plug in 13.1 grams of hydrogen per every 100 grams of sample. This is our mass percent conversion factor. So liters cancel, milliliters cancel, grams of sample cancels and we're left with grams of hydrogen. So let's punch that into our calculator. So we have 0 0.1 divided by 10 to the negative third times 0 0.789 times 13.1 divided by 100, and that in turn gives us 10.33 grams of hydrogen that we round to 10 grams of hydrogen. And if we want to determine the moles, if we want to do a mass to mole conversion, we know how to do that. 
So to go from the grams of hydrogen to the moles of hydrogen, all we have to do is use our molar mass. So starting off with 10.33 grams of hydrogen, we know that in, in one mole of hydrogen, we have one gram. A nice easy calculation, which in turn gives us 10.33 moles of hydrogen that we round to 10 moles of hydrogen, considering we only have one sig fig in our input. Any questions on this example? Any questions on this example? Really, don't be shy to ask. Does it make sense now so far? If you're careful with the units, you should have no problem with, with these examples as they just take bits and pieces from previous problems that we've solved. Ah, it's labeled 4.6.3. It may be towards the top of the chapter four problem solving module to answer your question about where to find the Canvas quiz. It should be at the, around the top of the chapter four module. So now that we've done a few advanced examples, let's move on and let's talk about a foundational concept in chemistry, which is the empirical and the molecular formula. So when we actually try to figure out the composition of a compound or a sample, we often get a mass or mole ratio of elements in a sample or the mole and mass percent of elements in a sample. Now, the mass percent, mole percent, mass ratio or mole ratio can be used to calculate the empirical formula. Now the empirical formula, empirical as in derived from empiricism or ex experimentation, the empirical formula quite simply is the simplest formula that contains the smallest whole number ratio of elements that make up a compound. You can also, and this is really useful, you can also think of the empirical formula as the smallest whole number mole ratio of each element. So let's do an example. So we have P2O10. So if, if you Google phosphorus pent oxide, you may end up getting this odd formula out. Well, let's take a look now and we have two phosphorus atoms for every 10 oxygen atoms. Is there a simpler ratio of atoms? What's a simpler ratio? Instead of two to 10, we can write this as, instead of two to 10, what's a simpler ratio? One to five, exactly. So we'd write this as PO5. Another way you can think about it is if we have 10 moles of oxygen for every two moles of phosphorus, we can simplify this to five moles of oxygen. Oops, let me make some more space. We can simplify this to five moles of oxygen for every one mole of phosphorus. So PO5 would be our empirical formula. And let me use purple for that as that's our color coding. So this is our empirical formula. Okay, let's do another example of this. Looking at C3H6, what would the empirical formula, what's the simplest ratio of atoms in C3H6? Is there a simpler ratio that we can write? Instead of C3H6, we'd write this as, So instead of a three to six, we can write it as a one to two, exactly right. So we'd write this as CH2. So our six moles of hydrogen for three moles of carbon, the six to three ratio can be simplified to two moles of hydrogen per one mole of carbon. 
And I really do encourage you to think about your empirical formulas as the simplest mole ratio, as we'll be using this idea of the empirical formula as a mole ratio a lot later on in this section. Now, a separate experiment, a separate experiment is done to get the molecular weight and to determine the molecular formula. Now the molecular formula is the exact number of atoms of each element in a compound. It tells you exactly how many. Now, molecules can have different molecular formulas while having identical empirical formulas. So up here we have our molecular formula. So we're looking at two different compounds and we're given the molecular formulas. Now, if we think about the empirical formula for each of these compounds, for NO2, the empirical formula is NO2. Looking at N2O4, what would the empirical formula be for N2O4? What is the simplest ratio of atoms in N2O4? What is the simplest ratio of atoms? If we have two nitrogens for every four oxygens, what's a simpler ratio we can write? Instead of two to four, we can write it as one to two, exactly right. So NO2 would be the empirical formula for N2O4. So we notice that these two different compounds have the same empirical formula. So sometimes you'll need additional information to distinguish compounds based on just their empirical formula. You'll need often additional information in order to get the molecular formula. Okay, so the way that you can think about this is that the empirical formula is repeated n times to give the molecular formula. n is our number of empirical formula units. The molar mass is abbreviated as mw. And what we can do is we can calculate the number of empirical units by taking our molar mass over our empirical formula unit mass. Okay. So let's show how this would work. Let's, let's show how this would work in practice. So the empirical formula of hydrazine is NH2 and its molecular mass is 32 gram per mole. Okay. And we're asked, what is the molecular formula of hydrazine? Okay. So first we need to solve for N. So N, we take our molar mass, which is 32.0 gram per mole. And we need to figure out our empirical formula unit mass. So, so let's, let's do that. So looking at hydrazine NH2, we know that the molar mass of this empirical subunit would be 14 gram per mole for the nitrogen plus two times one gram per mole for the hydrogen, which would give us 16 grams per mole. Okay, so that in turn gives us a value of N of two. So then what that means is we have two of these hydrazine units. So we have two of these hydrazine units. So then, how many total nitrogen atoms do we have? How many total nitrogen atoms do we have? If we have two hydrazine units, how many total nitrogen atoms do we have? Two. And how many hydrogen atoms do we have? And I'll be checking the chat 
How many hydrogen atoms do we have total? Four, yep, perfect. So we have our formula for hydrazine, our molecular formula for hydrazine would be N2H4. Does this make sense to everyone so far? Any questions so far? If not, let's keep going and let's do another guided example. Except this time I'd like you to attempt this problem and you can submit your responses via the Canvas quiz 4.7.1. So we're given that the empirical formula of benzene is CH and its molecular mass is 78 grams per mole. And I'd like you to calculate and determine the molecular formula of benzene. So let's spend about three minutes on this example, and then we'll come together as a group to discuss. And don't be shy to submit your responses via Canvas or in the chat or verbally. And if you have any questions at all, really do not hesitate to ask. And we'll discuss in about another two and a half minutes. And I already see some reasonable responses in the chat and canvas. Let's try to get a few more responses and then we'll discuss. And checking your Canvas responses. We have the responses I see via Canvas and in the chat look good so far. We'll discuss in another minute and a half and work through this molecular formula example. Okay, so let's discuss this example. So first and foremost, we know the empirical formula of benzene is CH. So then we can calculate the molar mass of this empirical unit just by adding up the mass of each atom in this empirical unit, which gives us 13 gram per mole. We can then calculate N by taking our molecular weight, which is 78.0 grams per mole, and dividing by the molar mass of this empirical subunit. And that in turn gives us a value of N of six. So then um, one way you can think about it is you can write out six CH units, or you can think of it as C1H1 and multiply each of your subscripts by N. 
Either way, at the end of this calculation, you will get C6H6 for our molecular formula. Does this example make sense so far? Does this example make sense so far? Any? Why did you add um, the one gram to the 12 grams? Ah, because looking at CH, we have a carbon and a hydrogen, right? And carbon has a mass of 12 gram per mole, while hydrogen has a mass of one gram per mole. You're essentially calculating the molar mass, except for this just this small empirical unit. That makes perfect sense, thank you. Perfect. Any other questions? Okay, so let's continue on. And now this is going to be a derivation. So this is gonna show mathematically, how can we calculate the empirical formula from the mass percent or mole percent of each element, okay? So let's let's start and let's let's talk about what we what we what we're often given. So we know that the mass percent is equal to so the mass percent 1 is going to be defined as let's define our variables first. The mass percent 1 is the mass percent of element 1 The mass percentage two is going to be the mass percent of element two. The mass one is going to be the mass of element one. The mass two is going to be the mass of element two. The molar mass one is going to be the molar mass of element one. Molar mass two will be the molar mass of element two. N one will be the moles of element one. N two will be the moles of element two. Mole percent one will be the mole percent of element one. I'm just defining all these terms just so that way when I use them, it won't be. Okay, so we've defined all our masses, moles, mass percent and mole percent, okay? So now, Let's talk about what we know. So fundamentally, the empirical formula, fundamentally, when we think about the empirical formula, it can be best thought of as the moles of one element over the moles of another element, which is our mole to mole ratio, okay? So the empirical formula can be thought of as a mole ratio. Wonderful. How can we use that? Well, we know that the moles of an element are equal to the mole percent of that element over 100% times the moles total. So this is, this is an equation that we can get by modifying our mole percentage equation. Okay, so we have an expression for the moles of an element in terms of the total moles and the mole percentage. Now this doesn't seem very powerful at first glance, but you'll notice a really important idea when we plug in and we substitute into our equation. So if we look at our mole to mole ratio, so if we think about N2 over N1, we get the mole percentage of element two over the mole percentage of element one times the mole total over 100 divided by 
the mole total over 100. And as you notice, as you notice, the moles total cancels, okay? So we're getting somewhere already. We're getting somewhere already. So we can equate the moles, the mole ratio to the ratio of mole percentages, okay? Now, additionally, additionally, we know that the moles of an element, the way we calculate moles is by taking the mass of your element over your molar mass. Okay, sure. And we know that the mass of an element is equal to the mass percentage of that element over 100 times the mass total. Okay, so let's write what we know so far. Let's write what we know so far. So we have N2 over N1 is equal to the mole percentage of element two over the mole percentage of element one. Okay, that's the first thing that we've established. We've also established that the moles of an element are equal to the mass of that element over the molar mass. And we know that the mass of an element is equal to the mass percentage over 100 times the mass total. Now you may say, we don't know the total mass. That's okay, that's okay. We have a, we have a trick for that. Okay, so let's write out the exact same expression for other element component. Okay, so now that we have all of these, all of these terms in place, now that we have all of these terms in place, what we're going to do is we're going to write our mole to mole ratio, which is N2 over N1. So that would be equal to the mass percentage of element two over the molar mass of element two times the molar mass of element one over the mass percentage of element one and lumped off to the side, we have our total mass over 100 and our total mass over 100. And as we notice, the total mass cancels in this calculation. So I'd like you just to appreciate the fact that the total mass does not matter in these empirical formula calculations. Now, from this information, so from this information, we have a nice simple equation now describing our mole to mole ratio, which in essence is our empirical formula as the mass percentage of element two over the mass percentage of element one times the molar mass of element one over the molar mass of element two. So this is a way that we've derived algebraically for you to calculate the empirical formula if we know the mass percentage of each element and the atomic mass of each element. Now, I am not asking you to memorize these formulas, but if you wish to use them in your calculations, I would be familiar with how these formulas, how we derived, how we generated these formulas. And it really is based on this idea that the empirical formula is a mole to mole ratio. Okay, now, this may not seem very interesting or useful at first glance, but let's try to apply this idea to 
the following problem. So let's do a guided example where we're looking at the following problem, where we're given the mass percentage of each element and we're given the molar mass and we're asked to figure out the empirical and the molecular formula. Okay, so we know fundamentally our mole, we know that we can write out a mole to mole ratio and figure out our empirical formula using this mole to mole ratio, which is equal to the mass percentage of one of our elements over the mass percentage of our other element times the molar mass of element one over the molar mass of element two. Now we need to define our variables here. So I'm gonna arbitrarily label carbon as one hydrogen as two, and chlorine as three. It's perfectly arbitrary. There's no reason for, for this number. You can pick and assign any one of these elements as one, two, or three. You just need to keep things consistent. Okay. And now as a key rule of thumb, you're gonna divide by the same element in both cases. So N2 over N1, and we'll do N3 over N1. We wanna make sure our ratios, we're dividing by the same element in both of our ratios, as it makes it much easier to calculate the empirical formula. Okay, so now that we have our equation that we've derived previously, we now can execute on solving this equation. So plugging in for the mass percentage of two, we get 2.079%. The mass percentage of one is 24.8%. The molar mass of element one, which is carbon is 12 gram per mole. The molar mass of element two, which is hydrogen, is one gram per mole. Okay. For our second calculation, plugging in our numbers, the mass percentage of element three is 73.1% for chlorine. The mass percentage of element one, which is carbon, again, is 24.8%. The molar mass of element one is 12 gram per mole. And the molar mass of element two is 35.5 gram per mole. So let's now punch this into our calculator. So N2 over N1, which is representing the moles of hydrogen per mole of carbon. If we punch it into our calculator, from our above equation, we get the following result. So we have 2.079 over 24.8 times 12. That gives us 1.00 moles of hydrogen per mole of carbon. Okay, we're getting somewhere now. Now let's look at N3 over N1, which is the moles of chlorine per mole of carbon. So for 73.1 over 24.8 times 12 over 35.5, that gives us 1.00 moles of chlorine per mole of carbon. Okay. So, does everyone see how these formulas from our mass percent are giving us mole to mole ratios? Does everyone see how we're getting out mole to mole ratios in this problem? Does everyone see very clearly how we got the mole to mole ratio? Does this make sense to everyone so far? Okay, 
Now, if you're not comfortable with this formula method, we'll be showing um, a longer, more stepwise method in the second part of this lecture. But for now, let's carry through and let's write out what we know. So thinking about carbon, looking at each of these ratios, how many moles of carbon do we have? How many moles of carbon do we have in our empirical formula? How many carbons do we have? If we look at all of these ratios, how many carbons do we have? One, yep. How many hydrogens do we have? If we look at hydrogen, how many hydrogens do we have? One, okay. And how many chlorines do we have? One, yep. So you're just reading off the numbers from your ratio. Okay. Now this example is explicitly designed to sidestep an, another step that we have to do in these sorts of problems that we'll talk about in a moment. Okay, so our empirical formula would be CHCl. And if we go and we look all the way, all the way at the top of our problem, our molar mass, our molar mass was 290. Point nine eight gram per mole. Okay, so next we calculate N. In order to do that, we need our empirical mass. So let's get the empirical mass. So that in turn would give us 12 gram per mole plus one gram per mole plus 35 gram per mole, which gives us a total molar mass, which gives us a total molar mass of 48 gram per mole. Now, punching this in to our calculator, N would be equal to our molar mass of our molecule, which is 290.98 gram per mole, divided by our empirical mass, which is 48 gram per mole. And if we punch this into our calculator, we get a value of N of six. So then, if we want our empirical formula, we're going to take each of our subscripts, C1, H1, Cl1, and multiply them by 6, which gives us C6, H6, Cl6, which would be our molecular formula. So this really shows how the, the equation that we've derived to calculate the empirical formula, which fundamentally is the simplest mole ratio of atoms of each element, can save us a lot of time in these sorts of calculations. Any questions on these examples? Any question on this example? We'll be doing many more of these practice problems. I just really wanted to help you see, well, why should I care about this algebraic method? Well, it's very fast. We were able to, just reading off our mass percentages and our molar masses, very quickly generate the empirical formula with not a lot of effort. So that's often why I like using algebra and chemistry. It saves us time. It improves our efficiency. And if you understand how these equations work, then you can modify them to solve new problems. So that is it for today's lecture session. We'll take a 45 minute break and resume in laboratory at 1245. And we'll finish up 
so the, the remaining empirical formula examples, and I'll show you a few other methods to calculate the empirical formula. So that way you have all the tools at your disposal. So I'll see everyone in lab at 1245 as we went a little bit over today.